Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the premier radio networks, including 111 of the best stations in the U.S. and Canada, on Sunday, May 23rd, 2010. This is episode 668. Enjoy. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy, and it's time to talk about tech, computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater. It sounds like the toy store, doesn't it? It sounds like the fun and games portion of your radio day. Well, it is. I mean, this stuff is fun. It is cool. It is the toy store. But it's also some pretty serious stuff, and we're going to get to that in a second. But first, I want to uh, invite you to call in with your comments and your questions and your suggestions and Yes, your diatribes and rants, if you have some, too. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 1-888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. We're on 111 stations all over the U.S. and Canada. And XM Satellite Radio as well. So anywhere that you can hear the sound of my voice, you can call 888-827-5536. Now, outside the U.S., it won't be uh, a toll-free call, but you could use Skype, and it would be a toll-free call. And we, since we have so many listeners... On the internet, all over the world, I encourage them to call in too via Skype. I don't know the uh, the details of the story, and we're trying to get uh, Leo on the line. Another Leo, Leo Ashcraft, who is the CEO of a radio station in Texas, K N O I, Real ninety nine point seven, Real Talk ninety nine point seven. Uh, they care; they're one of our affiliates, I believe. And uh, Leo sent me an email, and I yesterday I was just shocked by just sh I was. So uh, offended and upset. Uh, he had posted on his Facebook page a link to uh, my discussion of leaving Facebook. Because uh, maybe you don't know, but we talked a lot about it last week. I've decided that Facebook is just not the place I want to be. And I don't want to encourage others to participate. So I don't trust them. I think their, uh, their, their lack of regard for our privacy <clears throat> and worse... Their, their goal, which is clear now, to take over the Internet, to make everything go through Facebook, is just uh, not conducive to a free and open Internet, which I believe is very important to the future of this country and the world. It is perhaps the most important subject in technology today, is keeping the Internet free and open. And Facebook's a business. They have a right to run their business any way they want, and I have a right to quit. And I have not regretted it, let me tell you. In three days, you know, you you can delete your Facebook account, but they... Give you two weeks to change your mind. In three days, my, my account will be gone, and I will say hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise, praise them, Zuckerberg. I am gone. Not everybody has the privilege of deciding when to leave Facebook, and apparently KNOI has been bumped because they talked about me leaving Facebook. They talked about the privacy issues, and they mentioned Diaspora, the project to create a free and open social network. A Diaspora project is a project, one of many, I think, that are going to attempt to duplicate Facebook without the problems that Facebook has. I just received this email from Leo and his, and his press release on his webpage, and we'll put this on our webpage, techguylabs.com. On Friday, loyal fans looking for Facebook fan pages of radio station KNOI and KRBR The Rebel received the response, account has been disabled. Today, after posting messages in response to Facebook discussions regarding Facebook's new privacy policy, as I awoke this morning, says Leo, to find our Facebook page disabled without explanation. The post consisted of one or two line responses in discussion groups and pressing the like and share button on articles related to Leo Laporte the tech guy's decision to delete his own Facebook account to protest Facebook's behavior regarding user privacy. Additionally, we pressed the like and share buttons on a few articles regarding their up-and-coming rival replacement, Diaspora. Join Diaspora.com. 
Facebook's response, well, you, you can do anything you want as long as we say it's okay. There's no free speech in Facebook. Yeah, they're a private business, but I want you to understand that when you are on Facebook. They can do anything they want. I've taught, I have many friends who have been banned from Facebook for a variety of reasons. Facebook, of course, doesn't tell you. They haven't told Leah why his account was disabled. He says he's also been defrauded financially because we were Facebook advertisers and have been defrauded of unused funds paid to Facebook for this purpose. Boy, that, that doesn't surprise me, and yet it does, because that is appalling behavior. I'm sure Facebook will have some corporate doublespeak explanation of why they thought it was appropriate. But here you have a broadcast facility. This isn't just some individual. This is a broadcast facility exercising its right to free speech and reporting. But you can't do it on Facebook. You can't do it on Facebook. So, friends, May 31st is Quit Facebook Day, Memorial Day. A lot of people are going to be joining in on this. And uh, I have to say, last week I was merely saying, this is by personal choice. Uh, I'm not urging you to do the same. I understand for a great many of you, Facebook is the way you connect with friends, with family. You find new, new, new friends. And I understand that. And I wasn't urging you to quit Facebook. I was merely saying... I'm not going to participate, and if you do participate in Facebook, it would really uh, be good to remember that there is no privacy. And I tell my kids this. They're on Facebook. My daughter's getting huge value out of Facebook. She's going to be a freshman in college this fall, and there's a group on Facebook of all the incoming freshmen. She's meeting them. She's getting to talk with them. It's a great thing. The problem is Facebook is tyrannical. Facebook doesn't care about your privacy. They've demonstrated that ample times. And now, apparently, they don't even care about free speech. Facebook's been criticized in the past. They, uh, they deleted instantly any pictures of breastfeeding mothers. That's pornography. But for a long time, did absolutely nothing about Holocaust denial sites. Vicious, anti-Semitic sites. Did nothing about that. It's their, they're, a, they're a private company. They're free to run it any way they want. But we are also free not to participate. So I, I would, at this point, I'm saying quit Facebook. You know, I'm, uh, <laughs> if enough of us quit, there are ha almost half a billion users now. I just saw a poll that said 16% have already quit. Another 60, 60% are considering quitting. If even half of that number quit, Facebook would respond. The truth is, I think it's too late for Facebook. I think the management of Facebook, uh, particularly the founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, have demonstrated a clear, long-lasting lack of commitment to openness, to honesty, to privacy. They don't deserve our business. They don't deserve our time. And uh, I'm urging everyone to quit. I'm on the warpath now. This, that put me over the edge. Now, one of the reasons I'm talking about it now is because this show is heard on KGO in San Francisco, uh, the big news talk station right in Facebook's backyard. I hope Mark's listening. Mark, call me. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your explanation. Anybody from Facebook, I'd love to hear it. Facebook's attitude is, oh, well, we're an opt-in situation. You know, you don't have to join Facebook. As soon as you join it, though, we got you. And we're going to keep you because that's where your friends are. If enough people quit, if enough alternatives are created, and I'm sure there will be, you will be able to connect on the free and open Internet. If you're using Facebook for your business, you better create a, a web page quick. And, uh, and I'm sure KNOI has a web page. They do. In fact, I've been there. That's where I'm reading the press release, the press release that you'd never see on Facebook, would you? We brought the website down, by the way. <laughs> is, I'm telling you, I understand the advantages of Facebook. You can't bring Facebook down. I could send 100 of you, 1,000 of you, 10,000, a million of you to the same page, and Facebook would survive, but... Uh, I sent enough people to knoifm.com that the, the, the site is down right now. <laughs> but I am, I am just, uh, I have to say, I am just, I'm fed up. And I'm calling you out, Mark. I'm calling you out, Mark Zuckerberg. Call us, 8888-ASK-LEO. In fact, Mark, you email me, leo at leoville.com. I'll give you a private warm line number directly into the studio. Let's talk. You explain to me what's going on. You explain to the audience, the million people listening right now, what's going on. Why are you doing this? You, you better give us a pretty good explanation, because I have to tell you, there's no reason to stick around at this point. Now, contrast this with 
the really great news coming out of Google this week. Here's a company, Google, by the way, I think is very aware and is watching very carefully what's happening at Facebook because here's a company who has an equal amount of your information, maybe more. And their motto is, don't be evil, do no evil, be, consider the user. One of my employees just got a job. We were very sad to lose uh, Colleen Kelly, my uh, vice president of engineering here at our podcast network. She was just incredible talent but of course she got snapped up by google she's going to be a video streaming engineer over there not surprised and i wish her the best we took her out but i was talking to her and she said let me tell you the stuff that you sign as a new employee is absolutely clear you will not violate our customer's privacy you will protect our customer with your every breath that they you know and and i believe this about google and the minute they change believe me i'm coming on here and i'm, I'm going to give them the same uh, he double hockey sticks i'm giving mark zuckerberg but right now, I think Google is uh, is something to pay attention to. Their Google I.O. announcement, they announced some really exciting new stuff for their phones. They're providing a great alternative to another closed system, another system where you can't say what you want to. Steve Jobs, Apple. Now, you know I'm an Apple fan, and I love the iPad, and I love the iPhone, but I don't use an iPhone. I use a new Google Nexus One because the closed nature of the Apple ecosystem is bad for us all. And I think we're seeing with Facebook... We're seeing uh, what that leads to. It's war. They've just, they have just declared war on their users. And you know what? I'm fighting back. And I urge you to as well. I'll put a link in the show notes to a, a page on WikiHow. It's an excellent page on how to delete your Facebook account. But you know, if you go to Google.com, <laughs> I think this is kind of interesting. If you go to Google.com and you start typing, how do I... How do I find my IP address, get a passport? How do I love the number five down there? How do I delete my Facebook account? It's a it's trending, and you want to get that WikiHow article on permanently deleting a Facebook account. We'll put the show notes, uh, put it in the show notes. Your call's next, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. We could do a little experiment. Nick in our chat room is saying every time he posts anything in his uh, Facebook page about leaving Facebook deleting his account it gets deleted i mean that's wild so there's anybody has that experience i'd love to hear from you 8888 ask, ask leo do you are you getting censored on facebook well they say they do it anyway but uh but if you say something against facebook they delete it good lord uh welcome to the gulag i mean that's ridiculous i think what we should all do just as an experiment you want to just you want to see if facebook's evil or not let's try it Post a link saying, I'm thinking about, just post it on your wall. I'm thinking about deleting my Facebook page and put a link to the WikiHow article. It's wikihow.com slash permanently dash delete dash a dash Facebook dash account. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes at techguylabs.com. Just put that in there and see what happens. It's a good test. Maybe enough of us will do it that Facebook will just say, I, we give up. <laughs> we can't. There is a precedent. Look, I understand the power of Facebook, and the reason why it's hard to sh to, to to change is because everybody's there. Every it's a circular thing. Everybody's there because everybody's there. But we've done it before. Remember, everybody was on America Online. Everybody was using AOL Instant Messenger, right? Everybody was there because everybody was there until they weren't. Everybody was using MySpace. Until they weren't. Now, one of the reasons MySpace crumbled and Facebook emerged is because Facebook was there when MySpace was crumbling. And this is part of the power of Facebook, is that currently today, there's no good alternative. What do you bet there'll be 20 good alternatives in six months? That's what's so exciting to me about the free and open web. If you have an idea... You don't even need venture capital. You don't need a lot of money. You just need some skills, the ability to program, to write software, to design, maybe get some of your friends together to do it. You can use code.google.com. You can use Amazon's uh, EC2. Very inexpensively put up robust websites that can handle lots of traffic for nothing. See, that's what's changed. You know, when, when Mark Zuckerberg was a sophomore at Harvard and started Facebook, he had to get investors. He had to buy servers because there was so much traffic. He had to spend thousands of dollars right away. Even then, that was a big step forward in 2000, what was it, 2004, over what it had been 10 years or 
five years before that. But now it's even easier. So I guarantee you there are kids out there like the Diaspora Project. That's a, that's a great story. I don't know if it's going to be the one, but boy, uh, they're getting a lot of attention. They went to a site, a really neat site, called Kickstarter, where you can say, I've got an idea, but I need some investment. I need some capital. And, and I'd, like, I'd like to raise money to do it. So they went to Kickstarter, and they said, we got an idea. We'd like to make a, an open, standards-based, privacy-aware Facebook clone. And we'd like to raise $10,000 to do it. There were four students from uh, NYU. And they started a Kickstarter page. I donated $100 when I left Facebook. They were trying to get $10,000. They now have 5,658 investors and a pledge of a total of $182,000. A lot more than what they were asking. That's, that shows you something. And this is just one. I think there'll be dozens. So I think we'll have plenty of choice. I understand right now there isn't one. And, you know, I have to say, I thought I might go through a little bit of withdrawal. I don't miss it at all. <laughs> I mean, I use Twitter. I use Google Buzz, which I really like a lot. I use, uh, um, I have a blog. I have other services that I use. I have many of ways to communicate with my friends. I don't need it. What really matters is, what do you, if somebody Googles your name, what are they going to get? And what you want them to get is your, your web page where you put all your stuff. And if you don't have a web page, free, create a Google profile. That'll show up in a Google search result for your name. Google.com slash profiles. It's free. It's easy to do. You can see mine. I'll give you an idea of what you can do with it if you go to Google.com slash profiles slash Laporte. Probably should have been Leo Laporte, but it's Laporte because that's my, my uh, Gmail address. And there you could put pictures. You could say what websites you frequent. You can have a biography. You can have all the links to your stuff. And you have a button on there that says contact me. You even have a verified name. So people know absolutely who you are. You just write up here. Send a message. So long lost you know, boyfriend from eighth grade can find you and can email you. It's just that easy. That's, just, that's what you want from Facebook, isn't it? Oh, you want to play Farmville? Well, I can't help you there. 8888 Ask Leo. Jana's on the line, our first call of the day from Irvine, California. Hi, Jana. Jana? Hi, Leo. Hi, Jana. How are you? Hi. Um, I have a question about my iTunes library. It's a music library that's about 114 gigabytes. And I'm sorry, 114 gig. Yeah, gigabytes. Yeah. Wow. You got a lot of music. Yeah, I do have a huge uh, CD library. I just ripped everything. Um, and after I did the last two updates for iTunes, it now only recognizes like 58 gigabytes, even though when I go to like File Manager or File Explorer, it says that there's still 114 gigs. Oh, that's not good. Data. Hmm. And I don't know if anybody else had that problem. It shouldn't happen. It sounds like, you know, like you probably saw this when you upgraded to iTunes 9, that it said, I have to upgrade your database. And uh, what happens, I, what I think happened is it, it messed up. So is your, how important is your library? Do you have a lot of stuff like ratings that you care about that you've put in there? No, I don't. Okay. The easiest thing to do is to go to the library, select everything in there, and delete it. Not move it to the trash, but just delete the contents of the library, or even throw out the library files and start over. It should recognize all the files. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He! is Scott Wilkinson, the, the home theater guy at the Ultimate AV Magazine, uh, ultimateavmag.com. He's also a columnist for Home Theater Magazine, hometheatermag.com. He joins us every week to talk about home theater. Hey, Scott. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I wish, well, I'm okay, except I wish I'd had you with me when I was at uh, Costco the other day. Uh-oh, what'd you buy? Well, I mentioned this earlier. I bought, I went out and I bought, uh, uh, you know, we have been talking before about these sound bars, these single uh, bar that goes underneath your TV. I don't want to mm -hmm. put surround sound around me because I don't want the mm -hmm. wires. So yep. I thought, well, maybe I'll upgrade. I've been using just audio engine powered speakers with my nice Kuro and it's they're stereo, but it sounds fine. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, all right, I'll give it a shot. This one has a wireless uh, subwoofer. Mm -hmm. thought, Many good, of them do. Good. No wires. So uh, it's the Philips. It was like 150 bucks. I plug it in. It sounds like an AM freaking radio. <laughs> and then, and I could, I never did get the uh, subwoofer bonded. And all it did was click at me. And the whole thing was just a grave oh. disappointment. Yeah. Uh, so 
a word of warning. You know, mm. if you can't listen to these things before you buy them, and often in warehouse stores you can't. That's right. And even if you could, you know, it's a giant warehouse. Right. How are you going to know what it sounds like? Exactly. How are you going to know what it sounds like in your house? So read I, uh, read the reviews on Ultimate AV Magazine. Read Tom Anderson's reviews before you buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have not tried the Philips. I haven't tried many sound bars, but I'm about to get into them because they are, I think, an important product segment in the market. Um, well, they're for people like me. This is a real convenience not to have to put speakers absolutely. all around. Yeah, absolutely. Not only that, I had on my podcast uh, last week, um, or week before last, uh, Alan Kramer, the CTO of SRS Labs, and he was talking about how, in some cases, if you have a good quality sound bar, and SRS makes this sort of, I call it simulated surround, he calls it front rendered surround, mm. you can actually, in many cases, get a better sense of 3D envelopment with such a thing than you can with actual surround speakers, really? which... Yeah, which are uh, uh, acting more as point sources. Now, surround speakers are often dipoles, and they're kind of diffuse. But still, he claims, and I'm I'm looking into this now, that even that that gives you a sense of things coming at you from the speaker locations, as opposed to just generally con contiguous around the area where you are. So you're saying you don't you don't really want it to. You don't want to be able to pinpoint that, oh, there's something over my left shoulder. Over Correct. The you want to have kind of this, you're in a sphere where the sound, as in real life, comes from many, many, many sources. That's right. And, and you can it, simulate that with a bar using modern acoustic principles. Yes, yes. DSP uh, and what are called head-related transfer functions. Very fancy thing for uh, mathematical descriptions of how sound bends and diffracts around your head and gets into your ear through the outer ear flap called the pinna and uh, and wow. so on so it's very interesting actually and so um i haven't tried the Philips. uh i think the sony's are pretty good i've heard some really nice yamahas uh and samsung has some and vizio as well should so, it have been a giveaway that it was 156 dollars yeah, well, that. <laughs> yeah, that you know. It's kind of cheap. I I would probably go a little higher in than yeah. that. Polk makes an excellent one too. That that's well, like in the three or four hundred dollar range. That's at the least. one I should have gotten, and I probably I probably will. Uh, I, the, you know, the funny thing is, these audio engine speakers are very good. They're powered speakers. I used to use them for my you know like my um, clock radio, and <laughs> they sound really good. And you know, uh -huh. they fill the room. So in a way, I'm you know. Uh, but I would like surround, so I will. I will look with interest at, to your review of these, and uh, you can let me yep. know if there is a good one to get. And I sure will. And meanwhile, uh, it's a trip to Costco for me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> to bring it back. So, uh, you, you want to answer a question or two from your mailbag? Yeah, yeah, I've got a huge, hugely stacked mailbag here. So, I got one from uh, Robert Abel, who says he wants to get his wife a DVR. For, uh, they have Cox cable. And they want to be able to, you know, record programs to watch on their Sony HD TV. And which one is the best to buy? Well, I would say Cox Cable undoubtedly offers one, so you could do that. But it's that's almost always easier to do that, isn't it? It, it is because it comes. It, it's a cable box and a DVR, and you don't have to correct. do any infrared IR blaster stuff or anything right. weird to connect right. them. Right now, the problem with that is it depends on the user interface. I don't know what Cox is using. As their cable box, as their DVR, right. um, but the user interface might be good or it might be crap. So, so, so uh, literally, in some cases, what you have to do is hang something over the remote control infrared port so that the two can talk to each other. Yeah. Because yep, if I'm you think about it, the, the DVR has to be able to change the channel, and the only way we can do that is by talking to the cable box if they're separate devices. Sometimes they have a cable that you know you can just connect the two and they speak the language. Right. Now, there is there is another option, uh, two other options, actually, and they are the two that I would recommend. One is TiVo, and the other is Moxie, and you can buy those separately, and both of them can uh, accept cable card. So if your cable company, like Cox Cable, offers cable card, you can get that, and then the DVR becomes your cable box and also your DVR. Don't get me started on cable card. Uh oh <sighs> Well, You're this not, is something the FCC required cable companies to do, but they've got one in the back, and it's gathering dust. And go, and go, just try, just try to get the cable company to let you use it. And of course, it's not two way. So now they have this new thing. The FCC said, "Oh, well, I guess that was a flop," and they've just kind of rolled belly up, and they're doing something called all vid. So they have a new thing. Yeah. Which means the cable companies now can say, "Oh, well, cable card's obsolete. 
we'll get back to us in a couple of years when all of it is ready. <laughs> so good luck getting a cable car. Yeah, right? well, there is that disadvantage. I yeah, will agree with you. Yeah. But the TiVo interface is so... I'm not that comfortable or familiar I with the I love TiVo. No, TiVo's the But best. I love the yeah. TiVo interface. Now, the new Series 4, the new premiere, uh, is uh, reviewed by David Vaughn on hometheatermag.com, and uh, he does not like the user interface. For really? one thing, he says it, it, it uh, it's a step backwards. And for one thing, he says... It um, operates very slowly. It's like molasses to get to get the well, screen to change, which is not very good. I have a Series Three, and I love the interface. TiVo has always been the best in class. They're starting I to use so. Flash. They said now, maybe that's why it's so slow. Oh, that may be. That may very <laughs> yeah, well be. Yeah, I'm, anyway. I'm trying to get one of the uh, new TiVo boxes to try it, and uh, but I have the same issue, which is I have a Motorola, uh, uh, you know digital cable, cable box, box that I have to interface and, uh, you know, good luck getting a cable card. Yeah. I'll yeah. try. There, there is that problem. Yeah, yeah. I'll try. Exactly. Right. Uh, Scott, we're, we're kind of out of time. Moxie, by the way, is M-O-X-I, isn't it? Correct. Not, Correct. There's no mm -hmm. E in it. That, there's an interesting story behind Moxie's. I think that was a Steve Perlman company, the guy who did web TV and is I believe you're right. Live. Yeah. And then he's, it got sold. I think Paul Allen bought it mm -hmm. and then he sold, I mean, it's been through a lot of hands. It got a really good review on hometheatermag.com. Really? So, yeah, it really did. Shane Bettner, the editor of Home Theater Magazine, did it, and he really liked it. Oh, I'm going to have to reassess. It has th it has three tuners, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that means you Designed could... specifically for digital cable. Yeah. The TiVo will also let you take off-air uh, HD ah. from a uh, rooftop antenna or so. But as far as I know, the Moxie doesn't. It's only cable. And and does the Moxie charge you a monthly fee like the... Like the mm -hmm. uh, no, the Moxie does I, not charge a fee. TiVo does. TiVo does. So there's an advantage to Moxie. Mm. And it got mm. a good review. I'm going to have to check it out. Good. More things for me to waste my money on. <laughs> That's why I love this segment, Scott. Always. <laughs> Scott Wilkinson, editor-in-chief of the Ultimate AV Magazine, ultimateavmag.com. And, of course, you can write to him here, scott at techguylabs.com. We'll talk again next week. Don't forget, Scott's got a great podcast, by the way, on our Twit network, twit.tv slash htg. That stands for Home Theater geeks because he That's is one <laughs> <laughs> scott we'll see you next time you bet thomas in silva north carolina thanks for your patience hi thomas leo laporte the tech guy hi leo how are you very good how are you i'm doing fine i just want to say i've been a fan of yours since screensavers and uh, uh, love your podcast. the good old days of tech tv <laughs> what can i do for you today well i'm i'm the director of a, a little nonprofit organization and We've recently we've recently gotten some pretty good publicity, and I uh, have gotten a little more paranoid about security on my laptop, that sort of thing. Good, because you know, I mean, we keep getting stories about the British government losing laptops, and <laughs> I think there was a, a laptop loss that had this whatever the British equivalent is of the social security numbers for everybody on in England on one <laughs> one laptop they lost it. This, this, I don't want to be that guy. Don't be that guy. You don't want to be the guy that says, oh, excuse me, but I lost the laptop. Uh, we better send out a note to everybody. Hold on, Thomas. I'm going to talk to you about exactly what you need to know to secure your data. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. A suggestion. We were talking before the break to Thomas in Silver, North Carolina. He runs a charity. What's the charity, Thomas? Um, it's called Ears to Our World. Um, ears as in E-A-R-S, to mm -hmm. our world. We actually, what we do, we're kind of low tech actually. We use self powered shortwave radios. Uh, we give them to teachers in the third world so that they can have access to news and information from around the world. Isn't that cool? Ears to our world dot org. That is very cool, Thomas. Wow. Wow. What a neat idea. Yeah, it's been, we got some very good publicity recently in the Wall Street Journal and. It's, I mean, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a great to be at a place in my life where I can do this. So. Well, I'm, thank you for doing it. It's great. So you're right. I mean, anybody, anybody who has a business of any kind has some, some responsibility to protect the information that businesses inevitably collect, whether you're a charity or a profitable, uh, a profit business. Um, and you're right. Everything's on the laptop these days. And laptops get lost and stolen pretty regularly. I've had a couple lost myself. Yeah, in fact... <laughs> I think, you know, a few shows ago, you had mentioned that you'd lost your, one of your MacBooks, I think. Uh, my daughter, uh, well, we ha my daughter threw a big party for her 18th birthday, and uh, uh, 
during the party, her MacBook Air went missing, and a, a netbook that I had went missing. And it, you, I had exactly, it was an epiphany for me, Thomas. I had exactly that realization that, oh, my goodness, those, you if you get my notebook, my netbook, you get a lot because you the browser automatically logs me into a lot of sites. Uh, I might, you know, if you're a business, you might have a database of customers on there. And so it really did raise my awareness uh, as to the risks that we pose. And we're carrying that stuff around. I mean, it's pretty easy to lose it or get it stolen. Yeah, in fact, and, you know, I travel a, I travel a fair amount. And uh, I just, you know, I, uh, I've got donor information on there and stuff. And I want to make sure that, you know, it's protected even better than I protect my own personal information picky so <laughs> so now business laptops laptops that are aimed at business uh, things like the lenovo laptops uh, i got a dell a latitude z which is uh, aimed at business often have uh, pretty strong stuff built in to help you with this they may have what's called a tpm chip trusted uh, something module privacy module the tpm chip which is a trusted platform module which microsoft created the specification for uh, is essentially hardware encryption. And so uh, it's impossible to crack. It's strong encryption. You could turn it on and you can have your hard drive encrypted. Uh, many of these have thumbprint recognition as well. So if you if you really want to be secure, somebody steals your laptop, they need a fingerprint and a password to get into it. And if they don't supply those, they can't even take the hard drive out of the laptop. Now remember, you can protect stuff very easily until people have physical access to it. Then it's a little trickier. So, for instance, you could put a password on your Windows account so that a casual person snooping around can't get into your Windows account. You can even have it when it goes to sleep or a screensaver comes up, it comes back and asks for a password. That'll work fine until somebody takes the hard drive out of the machine, puts it in another machine and applies tools to it, maybe not even have to apply tools to it and can then get the data. So encrypting the hard drive is really the, the key. Higher-end versions of Windows have BitLocker. You get that with Windows Ultimate or Windows Professional. BitLocker is the same same idea, but it's software-based. And there's also a very good open and free solution for this called TrueCrypt. T R. This is perfect for a nonprofit. T R U E C R Y P T dot org, I believe. Let me type it in and see. And this does what we call whole drive encryption. That's what I'm talking about, where you don't merely have a password to log in, but you actually encrypt the drive. The advantage of these kinds of solutions are that once you log in, it's unencrypted. It acts as a normal drive. It mounts and it's there and all your data is there and visible. But if a person isn't logged in, it's garbage. They can't use it. So I could actually could actually use TrueCrypt and encrypt literally like my whole, you know, my documents folder or whatever that keeps the databases and things. And then exactly. I can run my... Uh, software and it'll pull from it? It does the same thing as a TPM module does. They call it pre-boot authentication. In other words, you have to authenticate before the system will even start. Oh, okay, good. And so somebody cannot get into your system. And if they pull the drive, what they see is random data. They don't even, in fact, TrueCrypt, because it's uh, intended to be used in places where the government, for instance, might not be, might be hostile, um, offers something called plausible deniability. The, 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 the drive just looks like it's nonsense data. It looks like it's random data. It doesn't look like there's anything there. So a, a, a crook or, you know, the bad guys in government cannot see what's on there. It uses AES-256. That's, that's what you want. You want really strong encryption. This is essentially what a TPM module will do, too. So if you have an enterprise laptop, you have that already built in. Um, and TPM is very strong, but you can do it in software either with BitLocker, uh, which does full disk encryption, or for free, TrueCrypt. I think I'll, I think I'm going to try TrueCrypt, and I, I guess now the one thing I've been drinking your Kool Aid, I should say, because I've got Not32 and uh, Carbonite. Good, um, good on the laptop, and use that encryption on Carbonite too, because now you're putting your data in the cloud. So they that's why they offer that AES-256. Yeah, and that's great. So that that would work fine if I've got TrueCrypt running on it. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, Macintosh has File Vault. Same idea. All everybody now has to offer this stuff because if they don't, um, you know, people will people will not use their systems. Yeah, you know, I I just feel um, you know I worry about privacy issues. You've been talking about uh, Facebook and. Uh, 
you know, we do, we have a page on Facebook. Um, and, and, you know, if for a nonprofit, it makes perfect sense. You know, one of the first things I did on Facebook, I put the causes application on there, which says, I support these causes, encourage you to do so. And a lot of money has been raised, ironically, for groups like the EFF. That was one of my causes, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, to support an open Internet through this. So, I'm, you know, the, the, this is why it's so difficult. Facebook's very, very useful. But ultimately, I think we have to stand up. Sometimes something's useful and still bad. They always said in Mussolini's Italy, the trains ran on time. Well, you, you know, it's good to have trains that run on time. It's good to have this kind of social connectivity. But at what price? Hey, thank you for what you do, uh, uh, Thomas. I really appreciate it. And uh, everybody should visit ears to you, our world dot org. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, the great Facebook jihad goes on. Notice in our chat room, N O T U S in our chat room says, and this is the thing that's interesting. We talked at the beginning of the hour about one of our affiliate stations, K N O I in Texas, that got banned from Facebook for mentioning the fact that I had deleted my Facebook page and linking to some privacy articles about Facebook. Banned from Facebook. And now we're hearing from a lot of people that if they ever post anything on Facebook about how to quit or they're going to quit or how to delete your Facebook page, that gets deleted. Notice in our chat rooms, took my challenge, and I challenge you all, I ask you all, post a link in Facebook saying, I'm thinking about deleting Facebook over the privacy issues. If I, I, I found a link on how to do it. It's on WikiHow, W-I-K-I-H-O-W dot com slash quit dash Facebook. Couldn't be easier, could it? And it's a really good article, up to date, on how to quit Facebook. Because Facebook does not make it easy. <laughs> Step one, by the way, admit you might have an addiction to Facebook. <laughs> Keep a track of what you actually do. You know, that's one of the things I found. Was, uh, I didn't, I, I thought I needed Facebook, and I really didn't. It was just a lot of messing around. It wasn't that important. So uh, I'm very happy I deleted my Facebook page. But here's the thing that really upsets me. People who say anything about deleting a Facebook page or put a link to the WikiHow article on how to delete your Facebook account are getting banned and or those posts are getting deleted. So notice just at the beginning, just an hour ago, as we were talking about it, notice did what I suggested and posted a link to this how to permanently delete a Facebook account at wikihow.com. That wall posting was deleted. Lou says, I did it too, Leo, and it's been deleted in a matter of minutes. Who do Facebook think they are? Shocking. That you, I want, you know, this is, a, this is a, a radio station fan page, a page for the radio station, disabled because they were oh, heaven for Fen talking about potential privacy issues on Facebook. That's more than that's that's this is serious stuff. You don't have much of a choice. I mean, yeah, we could say, "Oh, Facebook, please change it." But see, Facebook has shown their true colors now. We now know that they are in fact evil. If there was any doubt about it, we now know that Facebook doesn't care. Facebook's designed to squeeze every last dollar out of you. And if your presence on the Internet consists of merely of a Facebook page, they own you. I would call on you to delete your Facebook page. May 31st is quit Facebook day. Let's all do it. I've quit. I will not be back. Yeah, there, you may find other Leo Laports on Facebook because Facebook doesn't really do a very good job of policing that either, do they? I'm sure that as soon as I'm gone, there'll be 20 people pretending to be me. It ain't me. I don't need it. I don't miss it. Create your own web page. Easy to go to WordPress.com or Vox.com and create a free web page. It can have all of that. Vox has great social features. There are plenty of ways to stay in touch. How does, how does that old schoolmate find you? They Google you, right? They search for your name. So make sure that when they search for your name... Something comes up besides your Facebook page, because trust me, you're not going to want to be on Facebook. That's not where you want to be. 
And Facebook, if you'd like to respond, 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number, 888-827-5536. Or send me an email, leo at techguylabs.com, leo at leoville.com, leo at twit.tv, any of them. And I will, I will gladly put a spokesperson for Facebook on. I'd love to know what your excuse is. It's very clear now they are deleting any mention of quitting Facebook from people's pages. That's not your page. Let's make that very clear. It's Facebook's page. You think it's your page. It's Facebook's page. And anything you post there, that's not your data. That's their data. Anything they want to do with it, they can and do. That should be clear now. There's no question. No question at all. Saruman has revealed his true nature. The baleful eye of Mordor is looking at you. It is Mark Zuckerberg. Chris in Long Island, New York. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Chris. Hey, hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? All right. Uh, you know what my father always told me? What? Never put anything in writing. <laughs> Your father was a smart man. Well, well, he's Italian. And, well that, yeah, he's Italian. It's all uh, all handshakes. Hey, but yeah. it is it is true in this modern era that if you put it on the internet, you're making it public. And and it's right. really and that's, this is what we're learning is that Facebook, which made the promise that we would keep it private, really isn't. And so, so don't don't put it out there unless you know you're willing for everybody to see it. This is what I tell my kids: if you're if you're okay with your parents, your your school, your future employers seeing what you put there, put it there. That's fine. Okay, uh, I'm calling about a, a call I got from my uh, auto insurance uh, agent this past week, and uh, my billing system now is going to come over the email, and if I don't do it over the email, they're going to. Uh, Charge me ten percent to do it through the U.S. mail. <laughs> Your father would be upset, wouldn't he? <laughs> well, upset because how secure is email? It's not. It's 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 not. It's like they're saying send us a credit card through a, on a postcard that you pop in the mailbox. Uh, uh, possibly that, but you know, I, I would have my uh, you know policy number and uh, information and stuff like that. And this is just one company. What if? Other companies start picking this up. They want to just email things, and no, you know, no, not going to work. In the, and you should say no. Now, I understand they don't want to do paper, uh, right. and if they want to, for instance, on a secure website, their website have you log in and put data there. That's different. I mean, that's as secure as anything you you mail to them in a sealed envelope, because ultimately they're responsible for protecting that. So, if I pay a bill to a company. It, uh, you know, in an envelope via snail mail. Well, there's federal laws protecting the privacy. You can, assume, you know, sometimes mail carriers have been known to go go astray, but basically, you know, it's private, and it gets to the company. But at that point, the company enters into a database. At that point, right. the company does have it in computer systems. So you are ultimately always trusting the company's security. So going to, using a banking website or an insurance company's website that's secure and you're entering the data there is no is I think more secure than sending it through the mail because it's secure going all the way to the company and at that point it's up to the company to to protect you. Right. Well, this is what's going to happen in the uh, I guess the 21st century. No, you know this is an, this is a dumb company. This insurance company is dumb. They ought to know better and it, and they're not asking uh, the right questions. Email is not the way to do these kinds of payments. Internet. It's all safe, yeah, a website would be fine. I, I, look, I pay all my bills through a website. Right. But you're you're initiating the uh, the call. You're, you're initiating it. You're doing it. You're making sure that it says HTTPS for secure. So you know you have a secure connection, you know, and 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 you still you're trusting Amazon or Bank of America, or whoever you're dealing with, that they're keeping your data secure. But that's not different than it has always been. All right. All right, Leo. Chris, I'm Thanks. glad. I'm, what's the, what's the name of the insurance company? Allstate. Really? So they're saying we're going to charge you more if you make us bill you. Right. So I mean, they'll bill me every month, but it'll be over the uh, internet, you know, with with an email account. Now, is, is it true that if you have a Gmail account, they also sort of randomly, you know, read your email? Nobody, no humans reading your Gmail, but uh, but a computer is reading all of your mail. But you know, a computer is reading all your mail anytime. That's I mean, that's the way email is. Well, this is what they do. What they do is the same thing uh, they do with websites. They scan the email for keywords, and then they put ads on the right of your Gmail account that match those keywords. In fact, some people have done some interesting things. Uh, if you put enough horrible 
disastrous words in there. Gmail just says, no, we're not going there. We're not going to touch that. And they, you get no ma you get no uh, ads at all in that email. So okay. I, I have friends who have in their signature, I can't remember what the words are, like murder and, I mean, just horrible words. And they put that in their signature and they don't get any, any uh, ads in their Gmail because Google says, eh, we don't know what this mail is about. We don't want to put an ad in there. Because what they're afraid of is you send an ad uh, or an email, dear Uncle Joe, I'm so sorry to tell you, but uh, Aunt Christine has passed away. And we invite you to her funeral. And they don't what they don't want is an ad popping up there saying, you know, funeral home services. That would be right. that would be bad. So there are certain words you can put in there that Gmail will just go, no, nah, not gonna go near that. So they yeah, they scan every message. That's still and that did bug people when, when Google first started doing email, people said, huh, I don't know if I like that. But it's done by a machine. It's not understanding your email, it's looking for keywords in there. Right, right. But it's still scanning. It's still absolutely, but let me tell you something. You're, you know, who knows more about you than anybody? Your internet service provider. They see everything you do, don't they? Yeah. They well. see it all, and if they decided they wanted to record it, oh, guess what? The FBI has asked them to record it to keep it all online for several years, just in case. <laughs> so you're in fact being watched. Believe me, you're being watched. So let me let me underscore this, Chris. They may want to send you billing statements through the mail, as long as that billing statement is expurgated. It just it doesn't have too much information and it just says you've got a bill. And this is what I get from my from AT&T from many of my businesses said your new bill is online. Click this, go to the website and you can see it. That's okay. It's but as, so you want to make sure that all states not sending you personal information through the public email cuz that's not okay. Leo Laporte the tech guy. More calls right after this. Leo Laporte the tech guy. 8888 ask Leo. Well, the Facebook scandal continues. More people in our chat room reporting that their links on Facebook to how to delete your account are being deleted. Jotman says, they just deleted my last two posts on the on my Facebook wall. One was the link to the WikiHow article on how to delete your Facebook, and the other was a link to the article on KNOI. This all started this morning when I got an email from one of our affiliate stations, the uh, general manager there, who said, Facebook disabled our company pages for our two radio stations because I put a link there on the on to, to the tech guy deleting his Facebook account. I did that about a week and a half ago. Now, I don't question Facebook's right to do this. They can censor you. I just would urge you to think about, do you want to participate in a place where they get to say what you can say and can't say? It's not your page. It's Facebook's page. That's very clear. You know, I think the good thing to do, if anybody felt on the wall, ambivalent about all of this, try this little experiment. Many of our listeners are doing it right now. Post a link. I put it on the Tech Guy Lab site, techguylabs.com. Actually, James did. Uh, this is show 668. Go to that show, and there's a link there to the WikiHow article, How to Permanently Delete a Facebook Account. Just put uh, post on your wall. Say, eh, I'm thinking about deleting my Facebook account. Uh, I found an article on how to do it here at wikihow.com. Maybe if you're up in arms about this KNOI thing, we also have a link to their press release about how their pages were disabled because they talked about privacy on Facebook. Maybe just put a couple of those there. and, and then, But do me this favor. If then Facebook deletes that, welcome to, by the way, this is, this is like communist China. This is like, I mean, this is appalling. If they delete it, maybe you want to think about deleting Facebook. That's your only choice, by the way. There's no, there, Facebook is going to come back, I guarantee you, this week or next, and they're going to say, oh, we're sorry. They've done this before. Oh, gosh, we didn't realize how upset people were. We're going to change our privacy policy, and they'll put out another. You know how long their, their privacy policy is longer than the U.S. Constitution? It's over 5,000 words now. We're going to modify our privacy policy. It'll be fine. Trust us. They're going to do that. I promise you. So you might want to just think about, do I want to play somewhere where they control it? And do I want this to be my sole presence on the web? That's the thing I'm saying. Control your, control your web presence. Don't let Facebook control it. It's yours. Audrey in Riverside, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Audrey. Hi. Um, I, I just had a question about um, uh, getting an HD camera. Okay. And, like, what kind of would you, like, recommend? An HD video camera. 
Yeah, well, because, like, some, like, the camera that I have now, it can take videos, and when I put them on my computer, they don't look as nice. Yeah. As so, uh, <laughs> let me ask you what you're going to use these videos for. Are you making a, a Hollywood feature film, or is it uh, pictures no, of the just, kids? Or <laughs> Just, like, um, just like fun videos, like, with me and my friends, and... I, I here's I'll tell you one that I really like. Um, young people especially like these these flip cameras because they're little. You can keep them in your pocket and so forth. Kodak uh, makes a camera that's like the flip camera. It's uh, it's about one hundred forty dollars, the same price as the flip camera. Uh, okay. They call it the Z. It's high def. It's the Z I eight camera, and uh, that's like I said, about one hundred forty dollars on Amazon uh, dot com. Okay. It's just a little um, pocket camera. It gives you very good results. It's very easy to use because you just uh, plug it in the USB port to your computer and and then copy it over. And they come in aqua, black, raspberry. They're very, uh, very attractive. And I think really a uh, good video. Now, remember, anything this compact, when they say high def, it's not really high def. You're not, it's not going to look like a Hollywood movie on a Blu-ray disc. You understand that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I love the ZI8. I think you're going to like it. And uh, if you wanted to get a little higher end, you know, there's the Canon um, HF10 is an excellent camera. Um, you know, it's more of a more like a traditional camcorder, um, and and does a really good job. But none of these. That's the the Vixia. That's six hundred five or six hundred bucks, right? But none of these uh, are really true high def. And that's something people have to understand these days. You, re, you know, it says 1080p, and it will say 1080p on the video that you get out of it, and, and then the computer will say 1080p. But what it's really done, it's got a little tiny chip, and it's upscaling it to give it 1080p resolution. Most of the time, what you'll do is you'll shoot 1080. You'll import, I would recommend, at 540 because it's easier to edit. It's fast. I mean, there's so much data coming in. If you have 1,080 lines from top to bottom at 60 fields a second, that's a lot of data. And either it's heavily compressed, which is going to make it look bad, or you're just going to take forever to edit it. So my recommendation is to, to import, even from the ZI8, import not at 1080, but 540, one half. And you'll get, you'll, it'll look fantastic. It'll look better than a DVD. That's good enough, right? I do like the ZI8. Kodak's just done a really nice job with this. There's a number of good choices out there. The flip cameras are getting better and better. They're excellent, too. Um, one of the reasons I like the ZI8 is because it has an audio jack for a microphone. And it turns out that while the video is good, sometimes the audio on these cameras, because the microphone's in the camera, and so they hear you. You know how you, have, you, you do a video, and you hear Dad better than you hear the game? <laughs> He's going, come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> and you hear it in the distance, you hear the kids. That's because the microphone's right next to Dad. It's on the camera. So the ZI8 has a little jack that you can put an external microphone on. You might spend a little more now because you're going to get some devices to hook up microphones, but you can get much better audio that way. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. Try it free for the next 45 days. Go to go to mypc.com and use the offer code Leo. Just click that try it free link at the top. There's a good company. So I think companies that do well and, and should be rewarded, companies that respect their users, respect their privacy, should be rewarded, and then companies that don't, we got to punish them. We're having fun in the chat room. I love this. So we have a, we have a great chat room. There's a, almost a 1,000 people in there right now. You can get there by going to techguylabs.com and link, clicking that chat link. It's irc.twit, T-W-I-T.tv is the server, and the room is pound twit live if you're an IRC user. But what's fun is uh, everybody in the chat room now is posting this link to the WikiHow article, How to Permanently Delete Your Facebook Page. And then giving me reports on what the results are, which is kind of fun. Um, let's see if I can find some of these. It's been up for five minutes. <laughs> still not deleted, Dr. Mom says. 21 minutes and counting, still not deleted. And yet a number of the people, it's very interesting, a number of the people in the chat room uh, are reporting, I put it up, and it did. It magically disappeared. Now, if you think about it, we've got a million people listening right now. One million people listening right now. And if half of them, a tenth of them even, did that, Facebook's not going to be able to delete them all. <laughs> That's just not going to happen. But watch carefully what happens over time. 
XP99 says, it's still there 28 minutes later. <laughs> 23 minutes, 60 minutes, one hour, says Guy Dusset. I don't know if it has anything to do with the number of people listening, frankly. I, or, uh, number of, not people listening, number of friends you have. I don't know what it has to do with it. I, I would, I'm guessing that Facebook does have some uh, automated system looking for keywords, probably delete Facebook, Leo Laporte, that kind of thing. So those keywords probably need to be in there. But I imagine also a human has to review it, which is going to slow it down. Maybe not. I don't know. Rush Nevy in Los Angeles, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Shalom, Havareem. How are Shalom. you? Shalom. It's good to talk to you. Um, you know, I've been doing binary communications since the RTTY days. Wow. <laughs> okay. The old days and, when the uh, TTYs go chung, 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 chung. You have to put them in a yeah. separate room because they're so loud. Yeah, yeah. For those who don't know what that is, that's radio teletype. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, I, I've been doing what you do on a professional basis before I became a clergyman. And, uh, you know, I, I really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I gained a lot of knowledge, and I still try to keep up with things that are going on. Uh, and I started doing uh, MySpace when it came out. I did Facebook when it came out. And within the first year of Facebook coming out, I was telling people, it's not secure. And, uh, you know, and I, when I told him that, my account got deleted. You're kidding. Got, no, You're kidding. Wow. You know, and that's within the first year. And then so I came out with a new account called uh, Facebook Sucks. <laughs> Bam, that didn't last. Yeah, I long. imagine they delete that pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I mean, and another the, the one point that, is it's a private enterprise. They can delete anything they want. If somebody comes into your synagogue and starts shouting something horrible, you can kick them out. It's, a, you know, that's not inappropriate but this, we should know that there's this illusion that facebook is the public square it is not let me get to my question here um i was wondering why you think face i mean myspace has crumbled because i found that although their growth has slowed due to the quote unquote ross perot effect when the other ones came out that's right that's right they are still growing and they're the only ones that have bands uh they're the only ones that allow you to select any song you want from any band for your uh, flash player. I mean, uh, and no, I. No, MySpace I have, like, is a great, a great place for indie indie bands, and still and remains a lot, so a great. A lot way. of Facebook users are coming back now. A Isn't that interesting? Facebook. And not only that, but the thing that I recommend about them is that they are about as secure, maybe more secure, than uh, Google, because they are really strict about uh, all kinds of security stuff. Yeah, that, and that, that, that may be now. I mean, they have not, in the past, historically, MySpace has been appallingly insecure. In fact, uh, there have been at least two well-known incidents where uh, a, a bad guy was able to buy an ad, a, 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 an image ad on MySpace. They're, you know, they had an automated system and infect people who went, went to visit MySpace pages because that ad had a Trojan horse in it. So... I don't know if MySpace has, has, has fixed that. Um, I do think that one of the reasons people don't leave Facebook is there isn't a credible alternative. When MySpace started to crumble, Facebook was there. Facebook was instrumental in the failure of MySpace, right? Yes, but, you know, um, like, like I was saying, they, they really beefed up the security Good. over at MySpace, and, and they don't care about security over at Facebook. Well, that's pretty we obvious, yeah. And, How about uh, privacy? You know, one of the things I think MySpace did that was, I think, made sense was everything was public by default. And, and, and unlike, unlike uh, Facebook, you don't have these, uh, these free speech Nazis who cut you off right. over there. You know, so, and, and one uh, of the reasons that Facebook does this is from the MySpace experience. It was very hard for MySpace to sell advertising because an advertiser never knew what they were going to be, what their ad, what kind of page their ad was going to be on. And so it made it hard for them to sell ads. So Facebook said, well, we want to sell ads, so we better make sure that we police our pages so that we can make some assertion to advertisers that what, you, you know, what your ad will show up on is going to be you know, relatively appropriate. Well, your producer told me that sometimes you guys come and visit our area over in Little Ethiopia, I'd be glad to meet you sometime if I see you. 
and it's been a pleasure talking to you, and, and may you be blessed. Rush Nevy, thank you so much. Take care. All right. Goodbye. Yeah, really some good points there. And I think that um, historically people left AOL because there was an alternative. People left MySpace because there was an alternative. And this is one of the things that's keeping almost, there's almost half a billion people on Facebook. And, and let's not be deluded. I mean, this quit Facebook day, May 31st, more people will join Facebook in five minutes than will quit in that whole day. Don't think we're hurting Facebook's business. We're just making a statement. And it's for me, it's a personal statement that I just don't want to patronize or encourage others to patronize a company that is clearly not looking out for our best interests. And they, they've, they've, they've outed themselves. That's clear now. You know, and, and Apple's another company to watch at this point. Watch carefully because uh, it's not clear. You know, Apple, it, it, Steve Jobs... Uh, a very interesting email exchange with Ryan Tate at uh, Gawker, and uh, Ryan Tate was uh, had watched an Apple ad, and you know, the, Apple's always talked about the revolutionaries, you know, the 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 independent spirits, and they and equated Apple computers with independent spirits, free thinkers, and Ryan sent a note to Steve Jobs saying, "Hey, you think Bob Dylan would consider what's going on right now with Apple as as the revolution? I, I, I don't know if Bob Dylan would feel that way." Is, is Apple really about freedom? And Steve Jobs wrote him back. I thought it was very interesting. He, it's 2 in the morning, by the way. They're having this very extended email exchange. Steve Jobs says, yes, Apple does represent freedom. Freedom from viruses. Freedom from porn. Huh? <laughs> uh, and then Ryan responds, well, you know, I'm not sure I really think that's what fr freedom from porn is really what people are looking for. Steve said, well, you have kids. So Apple's very interested in molding the space that you play in. And Steve's point in that exchange ultimately was, you know, this is how we do it. We want to create an environment that's secure and safe and porn-free. But if you don't want that, there's competition. There's other choices. And that's true. That's true. So we got to make sure as consumers that we make uh, our choices fully informed. And uh, I think that's really clear. Hey, let me talk a little bit about backing up, and then we're going to get back to the phones. Ron's on the line from Miraloma. Ron, you're going to be next. He has an HP a desktop. Warranty just expired, and now he's having problems. Doesn't it always happen that way? Doesn't it always happen that way? Ron, Miraloma, California. Hi, Ron. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Good. Hi, Leo. Hey. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Ron. The problem, uh, I think, is uh, lack of respect from Hewlett Packard. Um, it's not that it just started. I brought this computer uh, about uh, 12 and a half months ago, first part of May last year. Right away I had problems. They had to reformat the hard drive and bring back all the data from the D drive to the C drive. Mm. Then it's a 64-bit um, um, OfficeJet. I've got the OfficeJet Pro uh, wireless printer hooked up to it, and that's when I started having major problems. I'd call the, te the customer service tech line in the Philippines or the India, and they'd suggest this, and they would say, do this and do that and try this. And I even gave them the permission to go into my computer at one point and do what they needed to do. Since then, I've had a lot of problems. Uh, I, they shut me off one time. I could not get the computer to, to come back on. I had to start it in safe mode. And with the new systems, I'm not really familiar how to troubleshoot them. Back in the old DOS days, I could do a lot, right. but now I can't. Yeah, uh, it's like cars, too. You can't fix, can't tune your car anymore, either, can you? I mean, it's just gotten no, so I complicated. I can tune my 67 Camaro. Sure you can. With a voltmeter uh, and a wrench, you got it. Yeah, <laughs> That's all you there need. You go. But I've had more problems in the last nine months, nine months, and I called them, I talked to them, I even talked to case managers, and I get no respect from wow. case managers. They wouldn't even make good customer service people. It's been terrible with them. Now, I called them the other day. They said, well, you're beyond the warranty. Oh. If you want us to do anything, oh. you got to pay us. Hold on, Ron. i got to hear more of this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. I love it. We had an HP engineer actually in the studio here, <laughs> and he had to go. But he was great because we have another person in the studio oh, who's uh, <laughs> who had a problem with an HP printer, and he gave him his card, and he said, look, everybody who works for HP represents HP. HP is huge, and uh, I think do fine products, and I think that any company that sells millions and millions of units is going to have some small percentage of them are going to have problems. That's just the way it is. I don't, uh, I don't hear an unusual number of bad reports about HP. Uh, on the other hand, 
you know, if you look at statistics, um, HP's return rate is a little higher, slightly higher than other companies. Ron and Miraloma has got a terrible problem because you were talking to HP and they didn't fix the problem, and then the warranty expired, and now they say, sorry, warranty's expired. Well, well, Leo, I've talked to HP numerous times. Many uh, nights I spent two, three hours uh, at a time talking to their tech service in, uh, in the Orient. I've talked to their case managers. I've had many, many HP printers, going back to the black and white printers. Right. They, they, I mean, look I've, at HP had, is the printer company. Right. I've had scanners. I had three of their scanners mm -hmm. before I got the all-in-one. Mm -hmm. And now when I've got a problem that they can't seem to find, the problem is when the, when the printer gets uh, on the hard drive, it stays on. It's like it's welded on there. It can't get rid of it. And now every time I try to reload it with their software from their website, it says I got two printers. Which one? Uh, and, and the printers are both busy. And yeah, I'm yeah. You, there's, there. it, so what, what, what happens when you do this is you create a, a printer, print spooler. You know this. Uh, that is right. sending the data to the printer. Obviously, you can't wait for the printer to finish. So the print spooler is an intermediary running on your Windows machine saying, give me the data, I'll spool it out. I'll send it out to the printer as the printer is ready for it. And these, these print spoolers are, are crashing on you. Now, and, and you've got two, neither of which is working. Chances are they're fighting with each other. It's prob I'll be honest with you, it may not be HP's fault here, uh, because obviously there are plenty of people using that printer and that HP computer that aren't having problems. Well, here's what, here's what happened. It really upset me. Uh, about three, three or four months after I bought the computer, I was at Staples where I bought it, and I told them I was having problems. And they said, oh, here, HP has a new program. If you bought your, or your computer at a certain point, you can get Windows 7 upgrade. I bought it 15 days early. <laughs> I contacted the HP about this. They said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You bought it too early. Forget it. They have to draw a line somewhere. I understand, but I've had problems for nine months. Uh, this, and they won't this, do is, this frustrates me, and I think he's wrong, and I think that this is one that you want to pursue which is that you were talking with them about this problem while it was in warranty, and now they say, oh, well, it's out of warranty now, so we're not going to fix it. It's almost as if they dragged their feet to the point where they didn't have to fix it. Now, I'm sure that's not what happened, but that's the way big bureaucracies often operate. HP's a massive company. Imagine how many customer service reps they must have. It must be in the tens of thousands. Right. Here's what you do. And this is my recommendation to anybody who has problems with a company. Write to the CEO. Write to Mark Hurd and say, Mark, I bought your products. I talked about this on the radio. I'm not happy. This is what happened. Every company, I guarantee you HP does this, every company worth its salt has a office of the CEO with 30 or 40 people in there designed to respond to mail that comes to the CEO about these kinds of problems. The company doesn't want this to happen. It's going to the top, and I mean the tippity top, going all the way, just right to the CEO. And then, Ron, if you don't get satisfaction, I don't know what's wrong, I can't help you. I have to say it sounds like it's a Windows issue that the print spoolers are gotten all tied up with one another, and this is a hard thing for HP. By the way, this is one of the problems in general is that you have multiple companies with multiple with interlocking responsibilities. So HP can say, well, it's Microsoft. Microsoft can say, well, it's HP. And both can dodge responsibility. And, and in some cases, they're true. It's, it, it, it's, it's just as you said. This stuff's too complicated now. Used to be you could fix it. Now it's just a hideous rat's nest of interlocking uh, code. And it's very difficult for any one company to fix it. But, you, but they owe it to you to give you a good faith effort, and they absolutely owe you uh, the chance to have it fixed under warranty, even though the warranty expired during this conversation. The conversation began while it was in warranty. And that's the point you have to say to Mark Hurd. And anytime you're having trouble with a company like this, I would say it's, uh, my strong advice is write the CEO. We live in an age that's really, uh, times have changed, both for the worse and for the better. And one way they have changed for the better, companies understand now, because of the Internet, they have to listen to their customers. Companies have, you know, Comcast started it, but everybody now watches Twitter with an eagle eye looking for complaints and responding to those complaints. Because it's too easy for any individual to cause a company real damages, real losses by being very public with their problems. There's a website, hplies.com, that I'm sure HP wishes they could put out of business. But the way to get 
to solve this for any companies to be very proactive when they get a complaint to respond make happy customers out of unhappy customers and you've gained a lot so that's why they all listen better than they used to it goes back to a book that was written 10 years ago now called the clue train manifesto and and the base basic message of the clue train manifesto is now thanks to the internet we are we are suddenly a much more empowered much smarter consumers and we demand more of companies we want them to talk to us responsibly to treat us as an adult as customers and and that's why now you can actually i think go to a company go right to the top and get and in many cases get a response and if you don't well good news you've got blogs you've got twitter you've got facebook as long as you don't complain about facebook you've got facebook and there are plenty of places that you can talk about it. and you can always call me we'll raise a stink about it 8888 ask leo that's the phone number 888-827-5536 is the phone number 888-827-5536 Elliot Schrag, Facebook's VP of Global Communications. Their shill, the guy who uh, said in the New York Times, oh, Facebook's opt-in, you opt-in when you join it, <laughs> has responded to the KNOI issue on Robert Scoble's blog. I will read his statement. He's not responded to me. I gave him the number. I gave him the email. I will read his statement when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, we started a forest fire, and I love it. It's uh, Let's fan the flames. Facebook is starting to respond in interesting ways. I talked last week about why I've deleted my Facebook account. And, you know, I'll be honest. At the time, I did not advocate you do the same. I understand. People love Facebook. They use it. It's in insanely valuable to a lot of people. I just said I didn't want to play in that space because I don't trust them. I don't like their grab for power on the Internet. And then I got an email from the general manager of one of our stations who says he linked to that comment by me, liked a project on Facebook that, uh, or, I'm sorry, a project on the Internet that was uh, designed to replace Facebook called Diaspora. And Facebook deleted the radio station's page. They disabled it. That's when I saw red. Now you're waving a red flag in my face. I defend my stations, and uh, this this is not okay. I asked in the chat room earlier in the show, I said, if anybody, let's see if this works. Well, let's go and uh, go on your uh, Facebook site and say, I'm quitting Facebook, or I'm thinking about quitting Facebook. Post a link, perhaps, to this WikiHow article, How to Permanently Delete a Facebook Account. That's what I use. It's a really good article on how to delete your Facebook account. See what happens. A number of people in the chat room said, oh, no, it's still there. In fact, uh, Dr. Mom, it's still there, right? Uh, a lot of people also reported, no, it was immediately censored. Facebook saying, oh, we're seeing it as spam. Mm. Yeah. We're seeing it as negative. <laughs> we're seeing it as anti-Facebook. We're going to delete that. Robert Scoble, my friend Robert Scoble, who's a well, very well-known blogger and apparently can grab the attention of Facebook better than I, posted a link to this conversation on his blog, scobelizer.com, and Facebook responded. Elliot Schrag, who's the vice president of global communications for Facebook, the same guy Facebook, uh, for, <laughs> i kind of starting to feel sorry for this guy, threw up against the wall uh, at the New York Times to answer New York Times viewer or reader questions. Responded. Here's his, uh, here's his response uh, to uh, Robert Scoble's post. Robert, I really wish you or Lewis, for that matter, I think, he, I think he means Leo, but that's okay, would reach out to us directly for comment before simply repeating someone's allegation. I don't know the situation with KNOI, and I've asked our teams to investigate the reason the page was disabled. I can state categorically, though, our policies would never permit us to take down a page because it criticizes us. You, of all people, should know and have reported that fa people who use Facebook regularly create groups and pages to criticize the actions we've taken or to call for changes to our service. A Facebook search this morning of the words Stop Facebook reveals over 400 pages out of half a billion that may involve such a protest, all of which are up and active on the site. I think it's irresponsible to repeat an allegation that we have begun to censor content and that we've started by targeting the fan page of a radio station in Texas. So I have, I have reached out, as I have all day, I have reached out 
Elliot, please. I put my email in the uh, response to your post there, which seems to have disappeared. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, you, you can email us. We'll get you on. Love to have you talk live to our audience and explain to the people in the chat room why when they say I'm thinking about deleting my Facebook page, that post gets deleted. Love to hear about that. Why is it? How many of you, let me just ask you in the chat room. There are a thousand people in the chat room right now. Uh, let me ask you folks in the chat room, if you in the last two hours put up this, you know, link or said I'm deleting my Facebook page, how many of you had that post deleted? How many of you have had that post deleted? Uh, Mup, Heinz DC, DK NPC twice, Sidra, not deleted yet. Many, many, more than half. Jazzy Green says, I put it up and have had it deleted eight times. All I'm saying to you is if you, if you put a link on your Facebook page that says, I'm thinking, not even I am, or I uh, encourage you to, or just say, I'm thinking about deleting my Facebook page. Here's how. If you put that, you don't even have to put here's how. Just put, I'm thinking about deleting my Facebook page. It may be, maybe that link, maybe they decided that link is spam. That's convenient. But let's so just say, I'm thinking about deleting my Facebook page. See what happens. But I would ask you, if it gets deleted, if Facebook censors that comment, is that something you really want to participate in? I have, I, I have to say, I have no regrets <laughs> about deleting my Facebook page. Nothing but joy and light. Ray in San Francisco, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello. Hey, Ray. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm very well. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm using a, um, a registry cleaner called um, C Cleaner. Okay. And, and the first part is no problem, you know, cleaning out the Internet, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But once I get to the registry... I get a whole list of things that they suggest to delete. And I know that if you delete the wrong thing, it messes up your system. So how yeah. do you know? You're using, by the way, the best, uh, if you ask me, if you're going to, I don't recommend registry cleaners, but if you're going to use one, C Cleaner is the best. Okay. It's from Piriform. And uh, what it does, among other things, is it cleans temp files out. You could do that yourself. You don't need it. But it's a free program, so why not? It uh, cleans out temp files. It cleans out, you know, uh, uh, internet history, cookies, autocomplete stuff from Explorer, from Firefox, from Chrome, from Opera, from some Safari. It empties your recycle bin. All of that stuff is fine. It's the registry cleaner that makes me a little nervous. And yeah. it, it, partly it's because I'm not a fan of the notion that the registry needs to be cleaned. You know, we're all geeks. We all... We all like a tidy desk. Not all of us. Some of us like a tidy desktop, like to tidy up, like to dust in the corners. And it seems kind of natural. Well, I, you know, if the registry has stuff in it that doesn't, you know, for, for, the registry might contain stuff from a program you uninstalled, for instance, that right. you don't use anymore. Shortcuts, stuff you don't use anymore. And it seems like sensible. Well, let's just clean that stuff out. But you raised exactly the right issue. If you clean out something that you need, and see, cleaner can't always tell. You can, you can literally keep your machine from booting. The registry is not designed to be edited. <laughs> it's not designed to be modified. And in my opinion, does not need to be cleaned. Okay. So I would err on the side of not cleaning the registry. I don't recommend registry cleaners. I, don't, I think they're of dubious value, and certainly the risk that you run is much higher. There may be some value. Uh, you know, your registry can't get too big. If it gets really, really big, uh, it can slow the machine down. Um, C Cleaner, of course, has lots of checks in there. It will back you up and so forth. Of course, if you can't boot, that's not much help. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's pretty conservative. You notice it's, it's not doing it without your permission. Right. It always asks for it. It always asks. My, my opinion is you don't need it. But if you want to do it, do, be conservative. Do the things it says it's okay and don't do anything else. Okay, I just leave the registry part alone. Leave it alone. You don't really, it, 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 you know, there are a few things that we as, as Windows users do as voodoo, you know, disk defragging, registry cleaning and stuff. And, and it's because we feel so helpless, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Windows is, is, computers in general, it just seemed, we seem to be at their mercy. And so oh. anything you can do, whether it's waving a dead chicken around your head or registry cleaning, anything you can do that, that 
I, I often say that my car seems to run better after I get it washed. You ever notice that? It just seems to, yeah, that's not running better. I guarantee you. In fact, if if they and I've had this happen, if they steam clean the engine, it can run worse. <laughs> it can break things. So I would say, wash the car. Don't steam clean the engine. You can. It's okay to run sea cleaner. Just don't be too aggressive with it. All right. I just won't use the registry part. Yeah. Okay. Just stay away from that part. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you need these things. I really do. A modern operating system, you shouldn't need anything like that, right? Yeah. Admittedly, uh, we've all grown up through the days of Windows ninety five and ninety eight and. XP and Vista, when, when you did kind of have to do some stuff to maintain it. But it in, in theory, you shouldn't have to, any more than you should have to tune your car up. It should just take care of that stuff. David in Park City, Utah. David Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello. Hey, David. Hey, I'm having a problem with uh, my mail in my uh, uh, MacBook, um, but I will digress to talk about the uh, issue with the Facebook thing. I tried it, and it was due, it was deleted within uh, less than a minute both times. Now, I'm sure Elliot, when he comes on the show, if he comes on the show, will say, well, that's probably, you know, automatic spam protection. But it, I find that a little disingenuous. It seems to be happening to too many people. And um, Exactly. I only heard part of your discussion about that, and... Uh, uh, clearly, uh, it's not what my experience was. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. I, uh, um, and a lot of people in the chat were reporting the same thing. So I, I, I think we have to call Facebook on the carpet here and say, what's going on? So what's your, problem with, what's your problem with Mac mail? User. I have various little posting on there. So maybe because I'm not a, a regular user, they uh, found it easy to delete mine. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. I don't know. And that's the problem. Facebook doesn't say. You know, I think they've exacerbated this. They've made it far worse by not uh, coming clean, by not talking. You know, they really, they've really obfuscated. They've really, I think, I, I feel they're being really kind of secretive about the whole thing. And I, I just, it makes me feel a little dirty to be participating in Facebook. And I'm just not going to. I agree. Everybody's choice. They can do what they wish. But that's my choice. So you're having trouble with Mac Mail. Yeah, I've got uh, a uh, MacBook uh, Pro, I've got an iMac, and the two uh, are both running currently through the same uh, uh, hookup, uh, Wi-Fi for the MacBook Pro. Oh, hold on, we're running out of time, so uh, hang on, we'll come back after the break and we can talk more about that, okay? Okay. Thanks for your patience. I know you've been hold already a long time. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I promise you, you know, I, we only have about 40 minutes left in the show. I doubt very much I'll hear from Facebook in the next 40 minutes. I have a feeling I will hear from them in the next four days. Maybe many times. And if I do, I will get them on next week. We'll give them a chance to respond. Absolutely. Love to hear it. Apparently, if you use my name, Leo Laporte, on Facebook, you're getting deleted now. We have a, a longtime friend of the show, Mark Sikernig, who's an uh, optometrist in Syracuse, New York, who, who merely posted my name, a simple message, something like, um, I, don't, I don't I'll have to find the message. And he says, it was deleted immediately. Immediately. So I guess I'm a bad word on Facebook. I want to make something very clear. I, my, I would have never been censored on Facebook, personally, to my knowledge anyway. I don't remember ever having been censored on Facebook. Uh, and I, Facebook did not delete any accounts of mine. In fact, uh, until recently, we had a very good relationship. <laughs> and I uh, was glad, a happy Facebook user. I, uh, of my own accord, deleted my Facebook account about... Uh, a week and a half ago on Wednesday, that deletion will become permanent. And I'm very happy that I did so. And I did so as a protest to two things. One, to Facebook's ever-changing privacy policy to kind of underscore the risks you run, assuming anything on Facebook is private. And that came up when I talked to my kids and, and I tried to explain to them that if you post anything on Facebook, you, you really should assume it's going to become public. It may not, but you should assume it is in case it does. That employers and teachers and Family members will see that. So only post stuff on the Internet anywhere, frankly, that you're willing to have be public. That's a good rule. You know, radio stations, we have a rule. Never say anything in the presence of a microphone that you don't want to go on the air. 
Many's the time a radio station host has exploded in profanity in front of a microphone thinking it was off, and it wasn't. I have friends who've lost jobs. So it's just something you assume. You're in, a, in the presence of a microphone. It could be on the air. You're in the presence of the Internet. It could be public. Just That's a safe thing to assume. And I strongly recommend you treat the Internet as well as Facebook that way. The, the other thing I'm protesting is, is much more subtle and much more difficult to describe. It is the issue of Facebook really trying, I think, to dominate the Internet, to create... To, you know, create a place where everybody posts their stuff instead of on a public open web page. It's easy. I don't blame people for doing that. But you ought to understand that Facebook owns that page. No one else. And the recent today's censorship is very clear. A very clear message that they can delete anything they want. For any reason. Now, we were talking with uh, David in Park City. He's got Mac mail running on a variety of different Macintoshes. And uh, what's happening? David, are you there? Did I leave? I am here. Oh, good. Okay. There's a, I get it. You're probably on a voiceover of the internet solution because there's some lag. Uh, you broke up that time. I'm on Skype and I'm not getting a really good feed that's, from you. That's what it is. Okay. Well, state your question then. Yeah, see, this isn't working. Sometimes Skype uh, is, is just unreliable. David, I'm going to put you on hold. Um, Gina, Gina Salvati is answering the calls here for me. Gina, if maybe you get his question and I can try to answer it uh, over the year. Maybe it'll work better. With Got you. it. Uh, and by the way, big thanks to Luis Oliveira and Gina Salvati in the uh, control room today, keeping the show going. Chuck in Riverside, California, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hello, Leo. You are my tech guy hero. Thank you, Chuck. I'm not worthy. <laughs> oh, yeah, you are. You know you are. <laughs> I am calling today because I am a student at uh, Keller DeVry, actually DeVry's Graduate School of Management, but it's really Keller. And uh, when you buy a textbook for any class you take there, generally you get it an electronic uh, text. And I got $1,000 worth of textbooks that are locked into use through... My scribe, which is their mm. you know, freely provided reader, but it really sucks, uh, is not very uh, functional. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is something that comes up a lot. Books, books, among all of the things that are copy protected, uh, you know, music, finally they've given up on that. TV and video and movies, that, man, they're still working on that. And books, especially, they just. No publisher will release this stuff without copy protection. And textbooks are so expensive, they're just terrified that if they give you a digital copy of it that is not locked down, that you'll, that you'll steal it. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they're very effective at their uh, reader. It's, it's uh, you try to, I've got Adobe Acrobat Professional. So, you know, one of my printers is Adobe. And if I try to print the whole text, I can do that. But when I go to uh, Adobe as the printer, it says, sorry, printer not supported. Yeah, yeah they're, that's good. They're, they're working hard to keep you from stealing. Because yeah. we, we all know that, that you are a thief. <laughs> that's, that's what always gets me is that, you know what, I'm sure a pirate knows how to get around this in minutes, seconds. It's only honest people like you and me that would be stymied by this kind of protection. I don't know any pirates, so that's... Oh, yeah, yeah. Arr, you need a pirate. So you'd like to get the books out of my scribe? Yeah, I want to be able to use them afterwards. They're really good books, some of them. Well, and there you go. <laughs> you didn't buy it, I guess. You just bought a license to read it in my scribe. Yeah, right. So you don't get to. I mean, uh, look, I mean, it's 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 probably a Google search away. I don't know, and I and even if I did, I'd be a little hesitant to tell you because it is technically illegal to do that. But as I pointed out, this that's you're seeing what copy protection action does. It teaches people to be pirates. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He is uh, Chris Marquardt, the photo guy back from Everest. You can uh, see his pictures and more at EverestTheTrek.com. Uh, and all your cameras survived? I mean, that's that's tough, uh, <laughs> tough, tough for gear, isn't it, up there? Well, yes or no. It's it's not it's not that we climbed Everest. It's, it's it wasn't it wasn't climbing. It was more a mountain hike. Kind you were of in the thing. snow. So, yeah, some some people said that uh, asked, asked how the summit was, and <laughs> no, we didn't go that far. 
So the camera actually well survived pretty well. The, the weather, uh, we were on the, on the Tibet side of Everest, so the, uh, the weather is pretty dry there, mostly. So the, there was a bit of snow and a bit of rain, but it wasn't too bad. Good. And Good. the only thing that can kind of uh, toy with the, with the lenses a bit sometimes is the, well, the thin air. The lack of pressure. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Um, and and that is especially true. John uh, John Miller from um, of the rest of Everest told me that um, when he was up on Everest Base Camp on the north side in 2003, he lived up there for two months, and he had uh, a video lens that some had some liquid thing in it, and that developed bubbles. So <laughs> as as soon as he went when he shot upwards, that thing turned into kind of a bubble level, and you saw this, he saw this bubble moving into the line of sight. Wow, really? But that that was just due to the lack of pressure. So some gas in there expanded, and um, as soon as he came back down, it it went away. Chris, while you were gallivanting around Everest, we were hard mm -hmm. at work back here on our assignment. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 70 participants or 70 entries for the um, time. Time, no clocks. Time, no <laughs> clocks was the assignment because Chris likes time to make it a little bit hard. So these are, these are all on Flickr. If you go to uh, Flickr.com, you, you need to be a member. If you're, if you're a Yahoo member, you've got it. It's free to join. F-L-I-C-K-R.com. And you can... Join the Tech Guy group, then you'll see all the pictures. Oh, I like this one of the stars going by uh, in the group. And, and we'll have a new assignment for you at the end of the sh show today. So uh, do join that group. Get up, get up there on Flickr so you can participate next time. So do you have three that you really liked? Yeah, three out of the 70 that came in. Um, the first one is by KBoom180, and it's called Salton Seas Relentless Time. Oh, it's so beautiful. So the assignment was time, and there was clocks, watches, timepieces of any kind were not allowed. And it was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> you could really tell looking at the pictures. Uh, lots of great submissions. And this is one of the really good ones. Um, and It's that, a time lapse. I mean, it's a, it's a time exposure, I guess you'd say. It, it's a long exposure. Basically, um, it's, it's kind of a, a double thing. You have the time uh, on the lower half, you see, it's probably it's, it's an abandoned trailer. What it says uh, in the caption. So it's it's a trailer that's just falling apart over and time. time so has the not time been has kind really, to it. Yeah, it's really in nope, bad shape. It's taken its toll. And above it, you see the night sky, and it's an exposure, a long exposure, probably uh, an hour or more of the night sky. And when you do that, when you put the camera on a tripod and you expose for longer time, the stars turn into star trails. Just so you beautiful. will see lots of trails and, well, the circle that the star uh, takes overnight or the stars take overnight um, <clears throat> become visible. Actually, they become visible really fast. If you do star trails, you can put the camera on a tripod and expose for 30 seconds and you will all already see star trails. They're moving faster one. than you think. And I like, I don't know if he processed this, but it's, it's kind of a sepia. It's a brown color. I don't know if that was the natural color or if he processed it. But that also kind of adds to the aged feeling of the photo. Yeah, so I, I, would, I would think it's probably, it's probably some processing in there. Uh, but a really good job. I like the way he kind of got the, the concept of time in there twice. And works, works really well. So well done. Well done. Well done. Next one is um, Unwanted from Badokun. Yes, uh, and that is time. This is junk. This is just junk. <clears throat> yeah, but it's junk that has been sitting there for quite some time. That's what it looks like. Oh, yeah. Uh, also so it's colored. A, it's, a, it's a monochrome print. It's a monochrome one. It is a very, very formal composition, very straight lines and uh, clear separation into two halves, the upper half or the background and the foreground. And... Very high contrast. I love that in black and white pictures. I love the um, strong contrasts. And here it's almost almost like a like a charcoal painting. Really well done. And well, the concept of time clearly is visible here. It's just stuff that has been sitting there for quite some time. No one's picked it up. Nice job, Badakun. Yep. And finally, time and travelers. This is from uh, Gius two thousand six. Yep. That has. I don't know. It just strikes according to me. So the way this was done, 
is that looks like uh, an airport, the conveyor belt, but another another is, time exposure. Exactly, right? exactly, and it's it's, the, it's basically the camera uh, being rested down on the handrail. Oh, oh, I've always wanted to do this. Yeah, on the conveyor belt. Yeah, and then that combined with the long exposure gives you this time tunnel kind of feeling, as if you as if you move into this tunnel, and. What happens here from a composition point of view, you have these lines that all lead towards the middle mm. and that all kind of lead toward the people that are on this belt. But as it's a long exposure, those people are also kind of fuzzy and, and um, yeah, they moved obviously slightly during exposure. So that adds this whole motion timing kind of feeling to it. So it's a real good job getting time in there without showing any clocks or anything that could give it away. Very, Good very job. nice. Everyone. Yeah, really. But this is this is why it works to have an assignment that's so tough, so constrained. It drives creativity, and people did some really creative things to show time passing. So I like that. Do you have another assignment for us, Chris? Yes, I do. Um, coming back from from the Everest trek and from pretty high um, elevation there, I thought I'd do something with air. So the next assignment is. Air which, is, air, which is in itself not that easy to depict, I no, guess. No, because air is invisible. But here's a twist. Yes. No balloons. <laughs> air, no balloons. <laughs> yes. You are so mean. <laughs> uh, I still, I can still think of at least five different ways to show air in a picture. Oh, good. Our, oh, no, I'm sure. And that's, again, that's the challenge. And, and the whole idea, this is not a competition. Uh, the whole idea of this is really to give you an incentive to get out there and take pictures. Because really... That's the fun of photography. We talk a lot about it, but let's do some. So go out and take a picture that illustrates the concept or idea or notion of air without a balloon in it. Now, what you do with that is you tag it air. You upload it to Flickr. It's free to create an account, F-L-I-C-K-R dot com. If you're a Yahoo user, you already have an account. You can just log in with your Yahoo account. And then join the Tech Guy group. You'll see a groups menu. Select that. Search for group. Search for the tech guy. Join the group. Submit the photo. Um, Orbit Gal is our moderator there. She'll say thank you for the uh, submission. You can do one new photo every week. And a month from now, you'll get a chance to do four photos if you choose. A month from now, we'll review Chris's favorite illustrating the concept of air. And all the details for this are on our website, techguylabs.com, including our selected photos from this week. Chris's website is chrismarquart.com. You go there to find out more about Chris's workshops, his podcast, The Great Tips from the Top Floor Podcast, tfttf.com. But Chris Marquardt's the place to go, C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R-Q-U-A-R-D-T.com. But we've got it on our website, techguylabs.com. Chris, you all acclimated. I bet when you came back at first, it felt like there was a lot of oxygen in the air. There, there still is. I'm, I can still walk upstairs much, much easier, and, and it'll probably keep going that way for another couple of weeks. So oh, that's cool. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it immensely. That's a nice side effect. Well, mm -hmm. in, breathe deep, enjoy the oxygen, and we'll talk to you next <sighs> week. <laughs> talk to you next week. <laughs> uh, Ms. Ba, or Ms. Ba in Torrance, California. Hi, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello. So, um, I did what you said. And nothing. I created a page, actually, that was Mark Zuckerberg is cynical. On um, I created the, that page. Yep, on Facebook. Yes. What's the What's the name of the page? I want to go there and see it. Mark Zuckerberg is cynical. <laughs> you know, I would imagine it at this point that they're getting a little bit sensitized, and it may not, it may not be as easy to get deleted as in past days. Mark Zuckerberg is cynical. I like that. And it's still there. Yes. And I uh, suggested it to all my friends, too. Good. Good. Well, there you go. There's another data point. And uh, by the way, a number of people uh, who said they were having trouble, like Dr. Sukernig, said that it was deleted when he said my name. He's found it since then. He was just looking in the wrong spot. So you do have to make sure... <laughs> You're not looking in the news feed. You want to look in your post to make sure that it, that actually was deleted. And, and as Elliot Schrag has said, there are hundreds, over 400 pages critical of Facebook on Facebook. Nevertheless, I, I do believe many of our listeners, when they say that these posts, these anti-Facebook posts are being deleted, and it wouldn't be the first time this has happened. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this.
Leo Laporte, the tech guy, the waning moments of the tech guy show. Don't forget, I continue talking pretty much nonstop. And you can catch all of that chat by going to our webpage, techguylabs.com. You'll see a link there to the live video, the live audio, the, the chat room, and the Twit Podcast Network, where this show and uh, several dozen other shows that I do are podcasted. So you can download the audio and video of them. Uh, onto uh, your computer or your iPod or your portable device of any kind for free. Don't charge. Spread it around. Give it to your friends. T-W-I-T dot TV. And the live stream is live dot twit dot TV. But the easiest thing to remember is techguylabs.com. It's all linked off of that. Now Pablo in Anaheim. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Pablo. Hi, Leo. Pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. I have a blog website, and I want to create a d daily video, and I heard someone calling about the Kodak ZI-8 earlier. Mm -hmm. I, I heard this about two weeks ago because of its ex uh, external mic. Yes. And so I guess I have a two-part question. I want to kind of limit the cost of purchasing another external mic, and I was hoping to be able to utilize my current USB Snowball mic and somehow attach it to the, um, the in-jack there, the line-in, that's a funny question because you're going in the opposite direction. You know, the reason they make a USB mic is because computers don't have an analog mic output or have a good one anyway. So they make a USB mic. Uh, so now you want to go the other direction. You want to get take that digital in and make it analog. Um, I don't know if there's a way to do that. There's, there's not a big market for that kind of thing. Uh, okay. That's a good question. How would I take a digital a USB mic like the Snowball and make it work with a ZI-8, which has a mini jack in, an analog mini jack exactly. connector? I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you what I use on my uh, Canon uh, Mark II, 5D Mark II, the uh, digital SLR that I use. It also has a mini jack in, just like the ZI-8. And I purchased for, I think it was $100, $150 from Rode, R-O-D-E. They make good some good podcast microphones, R-O-D-E mic mic.com r-o-d-e-m-i-c.com the stereo video mic has a little mini jack now this is great for a 5d because it has a shoe that will fit on the 5d not so hot for the uh, zi8 because there's nowhere to attach it to mount it okay. so uh, but it does do stereo what are you recording um, I'm just, I'm recording a, a daily video on using I'm a teacher and I want to record a video recording uh, talking about uh, technology. So the audio, the audio is you. Yeah, yeah, just Got me. It. Got it. So a lavalier mic would be good. Uh, a shotgun mic that's on the camera would be good. Either way, the problem with the camera mic itself is it's too far away from you and it get, picks up all the room noise because it's omnidirectional, so you sound like you're in a tin can. Right. Yeah. Right. And the snowball's perfect, but... Uh, yeah, mm, I mean, I guess you could... You know what you could do? You know what you could do? Yeah, you could record your audio onto the computer directly, and then you'd sync it up with the video. Take the video track, audio off the video track, and take the audio that you recorded separately and and sync it up. And okay. I'm, iMovie would let you do that. Okay. All right. Then now, I, here's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little tricky getting sync. On a short video, it's not going to be so difficult. It, if you did hours and hours, you'd have to resync every, say, 15 minutes or so, but a short video is not going to be too long. But what I'd suggest doing is clap at the beginning of it. You remember the old days in the movies, they'd have the clappers? You know, Shane 52, take eight, clack. That's what that clack was for. It was so Because in the old days of movies, they did record audio. They may still do, in fact, record audio separately from the film. And they've got to match them up. So they have the clacker, and you know exactly on the video, when that clacker hits, that instantaneous sound you match that up with the soundtrack and you've got it in sync got it got it well thanks again for taking my call i appreciate it anytime pablo thanks for being a teacher one of the most yeah. important things in the world have a great day really appreciate it yeah the zi8 is a great choice for i, I just love hearing stuff like that yeah, i mean he's going extra to the extra mile to do stuff for his students and he's recording videos with a zi8 150 bucks he's got a snowball yeah i think just put the snowball mic in front of you record to your laptop as you already do and then just merge the two tracks the audio and video track together that's how they may do it in the movies randy costa mesa california leo laporte the tech guy hello hey randy hey leo how are you very well 
Good. I, I used to watch you back on that MSNBC show with uh, Soledad O'Brien and you, had that show back in the early 90s. You, you mean me and the real me or the virtual reality character that I did? Uh, I think you uh, uh, both. You came I, did a, I did. A, I would come on from time to time as myself, but see, NBC hated how I looked. They actually told me, they said, Leo on TV, ew. So I'm not kidding. That was the word. The David Borman, the vice president of programming at, at NBC, said, "You." So they made me a virtual reality character, but I did win an Emmy Award. So I can't answer. Oh, I, I loved it. It was great. I know. And Soledad's gone on to very big things since, so that's good. Yeah. But um, I, I purchased a uh, Panasonic uh, 58 V10 Plasma mm -hmm. just recently, to, and I read great reviews about it. And I was replacing a... Uh, 42-inch um, plasma from Panasonic that I have for like six or seven years. Great. Should be a big improvement because technology's really leaped since then. Well, that's what I would think, but the 42-inch, the picture is crisper, cleaner, huh. sharper in every way. And it's very depressing to me right now. No kidding, because you probably spent some money on that. Yeah, I did. How much bigger, is the, new, how much bigger is the new one? Uh, the new one is... Um, 50? It's a 58. 58. Okay, so it may be that it is just that you're seeing more defects because of the bigger screen. What is the what is the material you're putting into it? Is it high-res, high-def video, or is it standard well, definition? Well, if I watch, um, like, uh, high-def stars movies or whatever, I'm watching those and just regular DVDs. Um, the really? DVD now, a Blu-ray DVD. DVD into there should be remarkable, markedly better. A DVD... Well, I have a library of over 600 <laughs> regular DVDs. So that's probably an upscaling issue. So the DVD is 480p. You're putting it on a 1080p display. So there's upscaling involved. And that's done in just like a computer. It's done with a computer, in fact, a digital signal processor. And it may be the old TV had better DSP, or it may be that it's not being done properly. So I would, I would look at your upscaling. The best thing to do would be to get a good HDMI upscaling DVD player. That would give you the best results. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week.